There are seas, mountains, and dunes, although not made of sand, but of heat-resistant organic matter. And when summer comes to the North Pole, it even rains methane. It's an amazing world, indeed. We are talking about Titan, Saturn's biggest moon, the second largest moon in the solar system after Jupiter's satellite, Ganymede. It is the only celestial body, except for Earth and Mars, for which the existence of liquid on the surface has been proven. It's also the only moon with a dense atmosphere. The diameter of Titan is 5,152 kilometers, which is 50% larger than that of the moon. While Titan is 80% larger in mass than Earth's satellite, it is smaller than Mercury. The force of gravity on Titan is approximately 1 slash 7th that of the Earth's. Titan's mass makes up 95% of the mass of all of Saturn's moons. Titan conceals many of its secrets, but today we will turn our attention to its amazing landscape. Now, the surface of Titan is composed mainly of water, ice, and sediment organic matter. It is geologically young and mostly flat, with the exception of a small number of mountainous formations, craters, and a few craovolcanoes. For a long time, the dense atmosphere surrounding Titan made it impossible to see the surface of the moon until the arrival of the cassini Huygens space research mission. Scientists suspect that there is an ocean of liquid water under the ice shell of Titan at a depth of about 100 kilometers. This is indicated by irregularities in the moon's orbital motion, photographed by Cassini in various spectral resolutions. The surface of Titan in the tropical latitudes is divided into several bright and dark regions with clear boundaries. Near the equator on the leading hemisphere, there is a bright region the size of Australia, which is high ground, probably a mountainous area. It was named Sanadu. In general, the surface topography of Titan is relatively level, with a variation in height of no more than 2 kilometers. However, local changes of elevation, shown by radar data and stereoscopic images, can be quite significant and steep slopes on Titan are not uncommon. This is the result of intense erosion in conjunction with wind and liquid. There are several objects that look like impact craters, presumably filled with hydrocarbons. Many craters may have been buried under a layer of sediment or were quickly smoothed over by intense wind erosion. The surface of Titan in the temperate latitudes is less contrasting, with distinct indications of volcanic activity. However, despite the similarity in the form and characteristics of the volcanoes, it is not silicate-based volcanoes that are at play on the satellite, as on the Earth or Mars and Venus, but what are known as creovolcanoes. These cryovolcanoes most likely erupt with a water-ammonia mixture, with a touch of hydrocarbons. Unlike on Earth, in the course of the change of seasons, powerful clouds of Titan move a great deal more along the latitudes, while on Earth they move north or south only slightly. Disappearing islands on Titan have also been a huge mystery for years. The largest of them is in the mysterious seas of Kraken Mare. The depth of the seas ranges from just several hundred meters. Studies of the sea Lygia Mare have discovered an unusual feature, bright, island-like objects that appear and disappear in some radar images. Moreover, there aren't any significant waves on these bodies of water. There are two explanations for what they could be, gas bubbles or solid floating formations. It turned out that at the surface, the mixture exists in the form of one phase, but at a depth of 130 to 170 meters, the binary mixture state changes into a combination of two liquid phases and one gaseous. The solubility of nitrogen in ethane is much lower than in methane, and it is emitted as a gas. Chemists estimate the diameter of the average bubble at 4.6 centimeters. This size is apparently enough for them to be visible to radar. Nevertheless, Researchers would like to note that there is not enough data to give an accurate description of the processes occurring in the seas of Titan. For example, the temperature and exact composition of the seas are unknown. More accurate data may be provided by future missions to the moon. A new target of research is Saturn's moon Titan, to which the Dragonfly mission will be launched in 2026. It is expected that in 2034, the eight rotor drone will provide Titan, detailed information which will receive electrical power by means of a thermoelectric generator. Becoming an eyewitness to these new discoveries will truly be an exciting and amazing time. Mars, by distance, is the fourth planet from the Sun, and by size,
the seventh planet in the solar system. We have seen the unique landscape of Mars. The extinct Martian volcano Olympus Mons is the tallest mountain on the planet, and the Mariner Valley is its largest known canyon. There is a huge number of impact craters on Mars. Mars has a rotational period and a change of seasons similar to Earth. Nonetheless, relaxing under the palm trees, which don't exist here, isn't going to happen. The average temperature on Mars is minus 40 degrees Celsius. To this very day, we are receiving a huge amount of data, some of which we already want to share. As early as 2021, we have observed the white clouds that occasionally appear in the upper layers of the Martian atmosphere. And as we know, clouds do not form on their own. For their formation, something is required to help the water condense. For a long time, climate models simply could not explain how these clouds could have formed at this altitude. The process consists of what is known as meteorite smoke, whose burnt residue helps the water vapor condense and turn into small particles of ice. This discovery prompted the thought that the fine dust that rises into the atmosphere after the meteorite smoke may play a role in the creation of Martian clouds, very similar to how glowing noctilucent clouds appear in the Earth's atmosphere. However, on the Temptera, located to the north of the Tharsis volcanic plateau, the probe managed to find what are known as Azars. These are rather low and very long hills, similar in shape to railway embankments. Azars, unlike many other glacial landforms, are formed not as a result of the movement of the ice itself, but rather from the meltwater flows that spring out from between the edge of the foot of the glacier and round, carving narrow but long channels tens of kilometers in length. Now let's turn our attention to what are known as the sand spiders of Mars. No, they won't eat the settlers for a snack. They aren't that kind of spiders. But one thing we know for sure is that Mars just like the Earth. Mars has its own weather system of air currents and climate. And these canyons, or spiders, as observations have shown, are constantly increasing in size. What causes them to grow? Actually, Martian sand dunes and deposits of dry ice, frozen carbon dioxide, that cover the dunes facilitate the formation of these landforms. In the summer and springtime, as the air and soil temperatures on Mars sharply increase, a portion of the ice warms and melts. As a result, the dry ice turns into carbon dioxide. A giant bubble of gas appears under the surface of the glacier, and the pressure inside it increases. After some time, it reaches a critical point, and the ice bursts open. The CO2 is ejected into the atmosphere of Mars through the fracture. Together with the gas, a massive amount of sand falls onto the surface of the dust-covered ice, which, due to the high pressure, turns this air geyser into a sort of sand blast machine, stripping away the surface. Therefore, the cracks through which the gas escapes grow each season and turn into the giant spiders that can be seen in the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter MRO images. It's difficult to come to grips with the fact that 4 billion years ago, Mars probably resembled the Earth. That means its vast expanses were most likely covered with a shallow ocean, perhaps several hundred meters deep, but not kilometers like on Earth. Clearly, there was water. There is already no doubt about that. However, billions and billions of years passed, and Mars rapidly died, becoming cold and losing almost all of its atmosphere. Astonishing Pluto was discovered by astronomer Clyde Tombaugh in 1930, the ninth in order when still considered a planet, it was named in honor of the god of the underworld, Pluto. The planet's orbit takes the shape of an elongated ellipse with a significant slope of 17 degrees to the flat plane of motion of the other planets. A complete revolution around the sun takes Pluto 247 years, and intermittently, for periods of almost 20 years, it happens to be closer to the sun than Neptune. Pluto's diameter is 2,374 kilometers, and its mass it is almost 480 times, less, times than less than the Earth, and its diameter is two-thirds that of the diameter of our natural satellite. However, so far, very little is known about how they formed and what is happening beneath their multi-kilometer shell. But nonetheless, the results of the survey were a real surprise to the mission directors. No one had imagined that the distant Pluto would not look at all like a smooth billiard ball, but would have an extremely complex relief reflecting the history of its origins. In the new images, Pluto turns out to be covered with recently formed mountains, 
ice planes, methane dunes, and even icebergs drifting through nitrogen. In addition to that, the ice crust of the celestial body is strewn with countless cracks that look like traces of recent tectonic activity. They were the first indication of the existence of a giant subsurface ocean on this dwarf planet. Soon, other evidence emerged supporting the presence of liquid water under the planet's icy crust. But how and when it originated on Pluto remains a mystery to this day. But we now know that at one time, Pluto was originally cold. This means that it grew slowly, accumulating ice material from the outer solar system. And at first, there was no ocean on it. Water in liquid form only appeared on Pluto after the core of the dwarf planet warmed up as a result of the radioactive decay of aluminum-26 and gravitational interactions with its satellite Charon. In this scenario, geologic faults in the celestial body would have retained signs of surface compression. Why compression specifically? The fact is that the heat emanating from the depth of the planet would melt the lower layers of ice, turning it into liquid water. Water which, as you know, takes up less space. As a consequence, Pluto's ice crust would have begun to contract, which would lead to the formation of distinctive geological traces. And what have we learned about Pluto's atmosphere and climate? Pluto's atmosphere is predominantly composed of nitrogen, with minor traces of methane, ethane, acetylene, and other gases. It is extremely thin, with a pressure about 1,000 times less than that of the atmospheric pressure on Earth. Nonetheless, it has a great influence not only on the climate, but also on the geology of the dwarf planet. For example, it facilitates the equalizing of the temperatures of the different regions of Pluto, and because of the greenhouse effect created by methane, the temperature of the planet's surface increases. Also, new data have demonstrated that some segments of the surface of the dwarf planet actually have snow caps, which are formed in a completely different way than they are on Earth. If on Earth, we are often able to observe the conversion of clouds into snow on mountaintops, since temperature decreases with increasing altitude, then on Pluto, there is conceptually the inverse process. Since the atmosphere there becomes hotter as the altitude increases, correspondingly, the physiochemical traits of the process of the formation of snow and snow caps on Pluto differ dramatically. In this case, calling it math ice is the most accurate conclusion. And finally, it turned out that the change of seasons on Pluto occurs not because of the tilt of the planet's axis of rotation, as on Earth, but is due to the elongated orbit over the course of a revolution around the Sun, which takes roughly 250 Earth years. The amount of heat received by Pluto changes almost three times. As a result, the density of the atmosphere fluctuates significantly. In the long summer, which lasts a little less than half of the Plutonian year, the frozen gases evaporate and in the winter they again revert to a solid state. They evaporate from the most brightly lit and warmed areas and settle in colder air. Located at the center of most, if not all, galaxies are supermassive black holes with a mass millions or billions of times greater than the sun's mass. For example, in the center of our galaxy is Sagittarius A, whose mass amounts to about 4.5 million suns. Of the known black holes, the one with the smallest mass is only five times more massive than our star, but 100,000 times more compact. The diameter of some black holes is no more than the expanse of a large city, but the weight of such a munchkin is like 5,000 suns. The radius of others is comparable to the radius of the Earth, but their mass is 6 million times greater than that of our planet. It simply gets the lost against the background, galaxy, say, which has a mass of 4.7 billion suns. The class of ultramassive black holes begins at around this mass the largest of which are made up of as many as 4.5 billion suns, but even they seem to be cosmic infants. Currently, the largest known black hole is the Tan 618 Quasar, which has a mass of 66 billion times the mass of the sun. It is located near the north pole of the galaxy in the constellation of Cain's Venetici, the hunting dogs. The Tan 618 Quasar is believed to have an accretion disk of hot gas orbiting the giant black hole at the center of the galaxy. The Quasar is estimated to be 3.18 gigaparsecs, or 10.37 billion light years away. The emission lines in the spectrum of Tan 618 are usually wide, which tells us that the gas in the accretion disk is moving at very high speeds, 
about 7,000 kilometers slash. The galaxy in the center of which the quasar is located is not visible from Earth due to the brightness of the quasar itself. Its absolute stellar magnitude is 140 trillion times greater than that of the Sun. It is precisely because of this that the exact mass cannot be determined. What can't be said about this new Challenger, which has the name Holm 15 -a. Holm 15 is a type CD supergent elliptical galaxy that is located in the Abel 85 galaxy cluster in the constellation of Cetus, about 700 million light years from the Sun. The galaxy of type CD is a subclass of giant elliptical galaxies of the morphological class D. Such galaxies have large stellar halos and can be found near the centers of some large galaxy clusters. They are often considered potentially the largest representative of galaxies in the universe. Holm 15 was discovered in 1937 by Eric Holmberg. The galaxy became famous after it was announced that it had the largest of all observed galactic cores, sprawling about 15,000 light years in expanse. But then the discovery was refuted. Now Holm 15 is taking the lead again. The fact is that the Abel 85 cluster has its velocity dispersion in a dark halo of about 750 kilometers slashes, which can only be explained by the presence of a supermassive black hole with an immense mass of at least 170 billion solar masses. Although the halo of dark matter is not subject to this kind of scaling, the evolution of a black hole in dark matter has nothing to do with baryonic matter. Notably, among known objects, this one has the heaviest supermassive black holes. This classic case tells us that the main component of the galactic core is a supermassive black hole with a mass of about 40 billion solar masses and a radius of about 790 astronomical units. By comparison, Pluto is located at a distance of about 39.5 astronomical units away. However, according to the data, the gamma radiation from the object is so extensive that some researchers estimate Holm 15 at 310 billion solar masses. How is it possible? Let's try to figure out this galactic mystery. It became obvious from observation that the distribution of stellar orbits was shifting more and more towards tangential motion inside the core. However, the displacement is less than that of other elliptical galaxies with cores. This tells us that, at an earlier time, there was a merging of galaxies with black holes. Astronomers have detected that the observed magnitude of tangential anisotropy and the shape of the light profile are consistent with a formation scenario where Holm 15 is the remnant of the merger of two supergent black holes. Now, the masses of black holes and galaxies with cores, including Holm 15 are proportionally scaled inversely with the brightness of the star's central surface and the density of the mass, respectively. That is precisely why the black hole Holm 15 has taken the position as one of the largest and hungriest supermassive black holes. The new estimate of its size is from 40 to 310 billion solar masses, and its rate of accretion of matter is estimated to be from about 8,000 to 45,000 times more massive than the black hole in the center of the Milky Way. If the black hole in our galaxy were to accumulate that much matter, it would have to mercilessly swallow two-thirds of all the stars in the Milky Way. Further research will reveal the secrets of this object, but no matter what, the Holm 15, a black hole, is One the, the heaviest in the solar system that is worthy of notice and examination, is located at an average distance of 250 million kilometers from us, and stretches out for more than one astronomical unit, that is to say, the distance of the Earth from the Sun. This region is located between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. As you may have already guessed, we are talking about the asteroid belt, a place where there is an accumulation of a variety of small celestial bodies of every possible size and shape. On May 3, 2011, a probe took the first photograph of Vesta from a distance of just over 1 million kilometers. After that, an active phase of studying this asteroid began. By June 27, the craft had slowed down, approaching closer to Vesta all the time. And after another month, having already made almost two revolutions around the Sun, the craft reached Vesta and switched to an orbit around it at an altitude of 16,000 kilometers. All of July, the craft was engaged in photographing the surface of Vesta. The probe confirmed just how large the Resilvia crater in the southern hemisphere is, measuring about 500 kilometers in diameter and 19 kilometers deep. 
The spacecraft also revealed that the mountain in the center of the huge crater, which the Hubble telescope had once captured, is more than two times the height of Mount Everest and is the second tallest mountain in the solar system, taking a back seat to the Martian Olympus. Upon closer inspection, the probe found a second large impact basin, now called Venia, that is partially covered by the younger Resilvia Basin. These two impacts changed the surface of Vesta and probably almost destroyed it. It remains a mystery how Vesta was able to survive such an extraordinary cataclysm. It is probable that numerous glassy V asteroids debris from the impact were scattered in all directions. Giant impacts have created dozens of gorges encircling Vesta's equator that were revealed in the probe's images. Some of these canyons rival the Grand Canyon in size, reaching 465 kilometers in length and 4 kilometers in depth. The probe's data also reveals that the massive impact formed Resilvia a mere billion years ago. Thus, the surface of the southern hemisphere looks younger than the northern hemisphere, where a tremendous number of craters have been preserved. Previously, researchers thought Vesta was a substantially dry object, but the Dawn space probe detected water-rich minerals on Vesta's surface that are associated with carbonaceous material. These materials were presumably taken to Vesta by asteroids or comets from the outer solar system that are richer in volatile substances. On September 5, 2012, having completed an extended mission, the craft broke free of Vesta's orbit and headed towards the next object of research, Ceres, a transition which took two and one-half years. On March 6, 2015, having traversed a total of 4.9 billion kim, at a distance of 6,600 kilometers from it, the craft was captured in the dwarf planet's gravitational field, and in early June, at a distance of 400,400 kilometers from the surface, the first photographs were already obtained. While the Vesta observations broadly supported the existing hypothesis and provided more details to fill in the gaps, less was known about Sears. In fact, most of what we now know about the dwarf planet was provided by the Dawn spacecraft. Initial calculations suggested that Ceres might be separated into layers, although the composition of these layers was unknown before. The probe, given a low average density, Ceres was expected to have a large amount of water ice under its surface. However, the probe's measurements have confirmed that Ceres is actually composed of a rocky core and a crust of water ice covered by a dusty outer layer. Dawn also uncovered evidence of the presence of clathrate hydrates, a gas trapped in the crystalline structure of the water molecules that gives While Ceres its amazing Ceres strength is relatively smooth in. due to its semi-liquid subsurface layer of ice. The spacecraft found a large mountain that it wasn't able to see previously. This mountain is about four kilometers high and is called Onamons. Its well-defined, dome-shaped structure, similar to volcanoes on Earth, suggests that it was likely formed due to cryovolcanic activity. Although cryovolcanism may exist on other icy worlds, Dawn's observations make Mount Ana the closest known cryovolcano in the solar system. Other observations by the Herschel Space Observatory have shown small amounts of water vapor around several portions of Ceres, which suggests that it may have a weak atmosphere or even ongoing cryovolcanic activity. The probe revealed that this gas could be due to solar particles colliding with the water ice on Ceres, which is then released as vapor resulting in a temporary weak atmosphere. Spectroscopic data from Dawn also confirmed the presence of ammonia on the surface of the dwarf planet. Conditions in the main asteroid belt are too warm for ammonia to form as it requires much colder conditions, raising questions about its origins. Ceres could have formed much further away in the colder outer portion of the solar system before migrating to its current position or ammonia could have been brought to Ceres by celestial bodies from the outer solar system. The spacecraft also confirmed the presence of carbonates on Ceres, which had been detected 10 years earlier using telescopic data. The great quantity of them once again confirmed the existence of an ocean early in Ceres history. This dwarf planet may even be warm enough to have a small amount of liquid water remaining below the surface. It's astonishing that for two centuries, the dwarf planet Ceres and Vesta appeared to be no more than dim points of light among the stars until the Dawn mission provided us with detailed investigative portraits of these two complex and fascinating alien worlds. 
The universe of Dune, or the Dune universe, is a fictional universe conceived by writer Frank Herbert and depicted in the Chronicles of Dune series of books. It has also been recreated in a number of film adaptations. While it's possible to discuss the Dune universe for hours, we will focus on one of its most iconic creations, the Sandworm. The Sandworm may be considered the signature element of the Herbert saga, famously known as Sh Shai Hulud by the inhabitants of the desert. The Sandworm is not merely a giant creature of Arrakis, but also a philosophical symbol. In John Scher's illustration for the first magazine publication of Dune in 1965, the worm's mouth consists of three parts, although it is not specified in the novel. The artist later created several cover designs in the same vein. This idea was adopted by the designers of David Lynch's 1984 screen adaptation. For obvious reasons, we won't be seeing large sandworms on our planet, furrowing through the Sahara or the Atacama Desert of Chile, and you can be confident that it's for the best. But nobody knows what the chances are of finding a creature in deep space that resembles the creation of the science fiction writer. We propose taking this topic into consideration in greater detail and answering the question, could the sandworm possibly exist in reality? To begin with, let's clarify what this giant crawling creature is. According to Herbert's description, the sandworm is composed of 100 to 400 individual segments enclosed in a thick, silvery-gray leathery shell. Each of the segments has its own primitive nervous system, so it is almost impossible to kill the worm. Even if one of the segments is destroyed, the other parts will take over its functions. Sandworms are enormous, reaching lengths of 400 meters, with the largest individuals exceeding 2 kilometers. The mouth of the worm measures 80 meters in diameter. Just imagine a huge mouth the size of a 26-story building surrounded by a multitude of sharp teeth. Yes, indeed, Shai Hulud is every fisherman's worst nightmare. But the most distinctive aspect is that the sandworm in Herbert's universe is not a member of the animal kingdom, but a silicon-based life form that fears water. All living creatures we know have common basic features. They grow, reproduce, respond to environmental stimuli, and are able to adapt and sometimes change. Additionally, they have a common basis for all biochemistry. However, Herbert's sandworm challenges these commonalities as a unique and fictional creation. While it is unlikely that a creature exactly like the sandworm exists in reality, the concept of a silicon-based life form and the idea of a unique and massive creature have captured the imagination of readers and viewers. The fantastical nature of the sandworm the adds to the intrigue carbon and molecules, the which use water for metabolism and energy. But it is possible that a non-carbon-based life form exists somewhere, and that such a life form would be very different from what we are used to. The ability of carbon to form long chains makes it an ideal base for building sufficiently complex molecules that the body requires to carry out vital functions. Yes, carbon is great for forming complex molecules, but it's not the only element in nature that can do it. There is also silicon, which sits under carbon on the periodic table of elements. This tells us that theoretically, such a life form is possible. In addition, if a sandworm generates oxygen, then the question arises, what does it use as a source of energy? The Milky Way is a relatively medium-sized galaxy that has nevertheless been able to provide a home to about one billion planets. Each of these worlds possesses its own unique features and characteristics that are sometimes radically different from those we are used to seeing on Earth. One of these unusual worlds could be a rocky planet that orbits four stars at once in the same system. Between one and two astronomical units from the center of the system, we find HD 98800, a multiple system of four stars located in the constellation Crater, approximately 150 light years from us. What can such a world signify? What kind of phenomena can occur on this planet? We will be imaginatively transported to this extraordinary world a bit later. Yes, in space, there are more complex star systems with two or even, more rarely, three stars that spin around each other in complex orbits. However, this new discovery is proof that this is not the limit. A group of astronomers were able to detect a system in the universe with four stars. Amazingly, all this time, it was hiding a mere 146 light-years from us. 
Instances of systems that consist of four stars are incredibly rare. However, the uniqueness of this object is further enhanced by the fact that HD 98800 has a protoplanetary disk. Using the Spitzer Space Telescope, astronomers discovered that it is composed of two belts. The outer belt is separated from the center of the double star by 5.9 astronomical units, almost the same distance separating Jupiter from the Sun. Researchers suspect that this belt is made up of comets and asteroids. The inner belt is located at a distance of two astronomical units from the center, similar to the distance between Mars and the Sun, and it looks like it is formed of fine dust. This kind of division of the protoplanetary disk into sections usually occurs during the formation of a planet. But in this case, it came about most likely for another reason, under the influence of the gravity of neighboring mate, HD 98800A, how is it possible? The fact is that in most systems, the disk is aligned in respect to the main star. For example, in a solar system, all the planets and most of the asteroids spin approximately on the same plane as the Sun. But this does not apply to HD 98800. It has a disk of gas and dust that is positioned at a right angle to the central stars. This is the first system that is known to us with a disk positioned in this way. Perpendicular disk, and such an anomaly promises many more exciting discoveries. Presumably, if astronomers manage to find other similar older systems, it will be possible to observe planets spinning in strange orbits at all sorts of angles. In turn, this might lead to the formation of new types of planets still unknown to science. However, another scenario is also possible. In such conditions, Planets simply cannot form from a protoplanetary disk. The search remains to be continued. In space, there are still many curiosities unknown to mankind. On the other hand, we now understand that planetary formation can, at the very least, begin in these polar circumbinary disks. If the remaining portion of a planet's formation process can occur there, there may be an entire population of displaced near-Earth planets that we have yet to discover. With such things as odd seasonal variations, but although planetary formation may begin, it is unclear to what extent planets can form and remain stable in such a seemingly chaotic system. However, if planets were to exist, the view from one of them in a system like this would be amazing. A hypothetical observer would see a bright streak rising from the horizon across the entire sky. From time to time, stars will pass across it, and since the system consists of four celestial bodies, a total of four suns would be visible in the sky. Because of this, such a planet would have an intricate system of changes of seasons, which couldn't be compared that is about 1.35 times the size of Earth and eight times more massive is orbiting the brightest star in the system, and in doing so, receives five times more solar radiation from its star. The researchers calculate that the detected object will make a transit all the way across the front of its star allowing observers from Earth to see the barely perceptible reduction of the light emitted by the star. The incredibly powerful effect of the four celestial bodies is literally tearing this planet apart, and the extremely high temperatures and high levels of radiation make this place absolutely unsuitable for the emergence of biological life nowadays. Thanks to technology, research is even more productive. Evidence of rainforest growth in Antarctica was obtained from a core sample of sediment deposit taken from the seabed near the 90 million year old Snavi OST glacier. During the first stage, the team discovered a fascinating dense network of roots that spread throughout the entire layer of soil, which was so well preserved that not only could countless traces of pollen, spores, and the remains of flowering plants be seen, but even individual cell structures could be distinguished. New evidence has shown that the ancient polar landscape wasn't merely comprised of temperate forests, but temperate and tropical rainforests. This means that the climate of the present ice-cold continent was not just temperate then, but substantially warmer than had previously been assumed. Antarctica was a completely different world. It was alive and flourishing in every sense. In addition to the dense and rich vegetation, various animals, herbivores, omnivores, and carnivores could be found. Among them were also arboreal forms of animals. By all appearances, the same as Marum bothrum glacialis, a small marsupial, something resembling a mouse or a possum. Perhaps small slopes that looked very similar to modern-day ones could be encountered on the branches. 
Among land animals, the most numerous were representatives of the Sporotheodidae family of mammals, a group of extinct South American anglets or hoof mammals that somewhat resembled horses. Judging by the structure of the teeth, they were herbivores and reached a body mass of up to 400 kilograms. Also on land, one could come across flightless or cursorial birds. One was ostrich-like, and the other carnivorous and probably quite dangerous. Along the shores of the ancient Antarctic Peninsula, one might run into king-sized penguins, and in the sky, falconiforms, falcons, and caracars. In the lakes, tumus spells waited for prey. There were giant crocodile-like amphibians. For example, Anna Spiden, reptiles of all kinds roam the land, impressive, massive predators. A small lizard-like inscore prolocerta. Of course, dinosaurs. It was not just a Jurassic Park, but a whole continent. The most exotic of them was the Crelophorus iliati, the ice crest lizard. The narrow skull measuring 65 centimeters with a huge mouth studded with sharp teeth could have swallowed a slow-moving person, if, of course, there had been any at that time. He lived on the dry land about 200 million years ago, as did many others when Antarctica was free of ice. Another interesting creature was the glacial lurus, a sauropodomorph and distant relative of the famous giant long-necked sods. However, the glacial source was much more modest in size. In all likelihood, it averaged 7.6 meters in length besides weighing significantly less, 4 to 7 tons, which permitted it to rise briefly on two legs. Who would have thought that 90 million years ago near the South Pole, the average air temperature in the summer was 19 degrees Celsius? That it was a tropical green world rich in flora and fauna now these are cold lands similar to mars so what happened what sort of climatic occurrence could have prompted such global changes a giant meteorite maybe a great worldwide flood or perhaps the expansion of the tasman's trade between antarctica and australia which in previous geological epochs formed the single continent no matter what happened the thriving world came to an end a new era had arrived, the era of the Ice Ages. And as it seems, after millions of years, this is normal for planets of the same type as Earth. Who knows what cold worlds, hundreds of light years away from us, are hiding under a thick layer of ice. And if there are only 32 or even fewer settlers, the odds leave them no chance at all, 0%. Perhaps the descendants of the original crew will reach Proximo Centauri. But by that time, they will no longer be able to establish a sustainable colony. But this poses the question, what if we use creosleep or suspended animation that can be beneficial in helping the travelers to conserve emotional resources and avoid burnout? It is possible, but not for long. In fact, for much shorter than we think. Since this sort of hibernation carries risks, even if people go into it for several months and not years, the consequences may not be reversible. And from what was a strong team, all that will remain will be exhausted and depressed travelers. Therefore, we're back to the old scenario. So, having left the Earth behind, the 98 space travelers will give birth to children, and they to grandchildren, even during the lifetime of the first generation. So, judging by the calculations, the maximum population on the Ark could reach 500 people. And this means that the colonists will have to provide themselves with food on their own. In other words, grow it directly on board the ship. But how much food do they need? After all, the size of the ship depends on this and therefore the energy required to move it. These calculations require taking not only the size of the crew into account, but also the average age of the spaceship's inhabitants, their height, weight, and level of physical activity in order to understand how many calories they will each need annually. If the ship is constructed in the form of a rotating cylinder so that the centrifugal force provides artificial gravity, then the height of the agricultural compartment should be 320 meters, with a radius of 224 meters. Europa is the biggest moon of Jupiter, with a huge ocean beneath the surface. The satellite's water, under a huge layer of ice, does not freeze because of the hot core of Europa, which is heated by Jupiter's gravity. This became known in the early 2000s thanks to the Galileo Pro, which detected marks of an electrically conductive liquid under the surface of Europa. 
It also discovered that the surface is made of ice and that it's one of the smoothest in the solar system. It might seem that this is where our knowledge ends, but this is not true. Over the past 20 years, and especially recently, we have learned a lot of exciting details about this distant satellite. We offer to ponder on some of them and reflect on to what degree this distant world can be alive. So Europa, also known as Jupiter 2, is the sixth moon of Jupiter, the smallest of the four Galilean satellites. It was discovered in 1610 by Galileo Galilei. Over the centuries, more and more comprehensive observations of Europa were made with telescopes, and since the 70s of the 20th century, with flying spacecraft. Europa is slightly smaller than the moon, with a diameter of 3,122 kilometers. It is the sixth in size among satellites and the 15th among all objects in the solar system. Water enters the atmosphere at a rate of about 2,360 liters per second. If the dwellers of Europa were in that stream, that would have been their last attraction. The good news is, those inhabitants who would manage not to be blown into outer space would be very easy to find as the surface of Europa is one of the flattest in the solar system. The tallest formations that can be found here are merely several hundred meters. If we take a close look at Europa's surface images, we will see signs of endogenous geological activity, such as lines, lenticles, bumps, and pits, and the so-called chaos. Below the center, the high albedo of the satellite indicates that the surface of the ice is pretty clean and young. It is believed that the cleaner the ice on the surface of the icy satellites, the younger it is. Let's also pay attention to the plains. Smooth plains can be formed by the activity of creovolcanoes which erupt to the surface, filling areas with spreading and hardening water. From Europa's orbit, we can see a chaotic relief that has different geometric shapes. We can also observe areas dominated by lines and stripes, usually double, as well as impact craters. Their number is small, with only 40 named craters over 5 kilometers in diameter, which suggests that the surface is relatively young, ranging from 20 to 180 million years old. So, Europa has high geological activity. The spectral analysis of the dark lines and spots on the surface shows the presence of salts, magnesium sulfate in particular. The reddish hue allows us to assume the presence of iron and sulfur compounds as well. Apparently, they are contained in the ocean of Europa and are ejected to the surface through clefts and then freeze. In addition, traces of hydrogen peroxide and strong acids were found. For instance, there is a high chance that Europa that contains object. sulfuric acid. As it turns out, it's not that easy. The thing is, Jupiter's moon Europa is surrounded by a region of sharp ice needles, which stretches along the entire equator and is extremely dangerous for spacecraft to land on. Ice needles, also known as callosporas, on Europa can reach up to 15 meters in height. As large as they are, these structures still cannot be seen on the images of Europa available to us so far. After a few careful maneuvers, we landed. Few, we managed not to damage our spacecraft by this gigantic icicle. The incredible view of Europa opens to our eyes. Its surface is very cold compared to Earth. The temperature here is minus 150 to minus 100 degrees Celsius below zero. But that is not the main thing to worry about here. The radiation level on Europa is extremely high as the satellite's orbit passes through the powerful radiation belt of Jupiter. The daily dose of radiation here is nearly a million times bigger than on Earth. This dose is enough to cause severe radiation sickness. But worries? We have proper radiation protection, at least we hope so. Well, with this in mind, we are sending a tunnel robot with a nuclear reactor into the depths of Europa. It could drill ice while collecting ice and water samples and sending information to the surface by a fiber optic cable. Surprisingly, Europa has several layers of ocean separated by different types of ice formed at different depths and under different pressures. It is likely that in each of these layers, different life forms might be found. Species that have adapted to the particular conditions of the ocean stratum may exist. However, if these life forms turn out to be unlike anything we have seen on Earth, it might be difficult for us to recognize them. Besides, we might not find life there at all. But these thoughts wouldn't stop our curiosity, would they? More than 40 years ago, the Voyager space probe, exploring the vicinity of Jupiter, 
took the first photographs of the bright yellow surface of one of the moons of the giant planet Io. It is the most volcanically active world in the solar system, with hundreds of volcanoes, some of which erupt lava fountains up to 200 kilometers high and even higher. Even then, it was clear that this was an extraordinary, ever-changing world. Besides, it was the Voyager that, for the first time, managed to document Jupiter's radiation belt, which passes right across the line of Io's orbit. It is entirely because of such unfortunate positioning that the level of radiation from the giant planet on its nearest satellite is 1,000 times stronger than the level of radiation on the Earth's surface, which makes finding a person on Io simply impossible, or possible, but not for long. Thanks to the data collected by spacecraft such as Voyager 1 and 2, Galileo, and New Horizons, we have learned a great deal. But at this very moment, the Juno spacecraft is there, and its data has tremendously expanded our understanding of this hellish place. In fact, Io is slightly larger than our Earth's moon, a mere 5%, and orbits at a distance of just over 400,000 kilometers from Jupiter. This satellite is always pointed at one side of its planet, making a complete revolution around it in 42.5 hours. But the most unusual and exciting thing that the Juno probe registered on the moon of Io was its surface. The tremendous quantity of heat inside the moon keeps most of its subsurface crust in liquid form, seeks any accessible outlet to the surface in order to relieve the pressure. As such, Io's surface is constantly regenerating itself, filling any impact craters with lakes of molten lava. It is assumed that the composition of this material is predominantly molten sulfur, its compounds, and silicate rock, which better accounts for an apparent temperature that may be too high. Sulfur dioxide, incidentally, is the primary component of the satellite's atmosphere, although it is extremely thin and low in density. In fact, it is more correctly referred to as an exosphere, which is filled with volcanic gases. The volcanic atmospheric discharges do not contain water and water steam. Thus, being without water, Io significantly differs from the other satellites of Jupiter. The colder Galilean moons. Io's colorful and bright surface appearance is the result of the rigorous work of the volcanoes, which emit various substances in the form of sulfur dioxide and silicates. A frosting of sulfur dioxide coats much of the moon's surface, coloring its regions white or gray. In many regions, sulfur is also visible due to its yellow and yellow-green color. At mid and high latitudes, radiation is usually broken down by the stable octatonic cyclic molecules of sulfur, as a result of which Io's polar no regions are 100 formidable volcanoes on Io, and moreover, about 150 can be active at the same time, generating veritable chaos on the surface. Flows of basaltic lava are a common sight in this place. Magma bursts forth onto the surface through inclines on the bottom of pateras, which are formations with a flat bottom and steep walls, or through the cracks in the flat bottoms, creating numerous wide lava flows. During exceptionally large eruptions, such lava flows can stretch for hundreds of kilometers. As a result of volcanic activity, sulfur dioxide in the form of gas and silicate matter in the form of ash rise to a height of up to 200 kilometers into outer space forming a kind of radiation umbrella. And after falling, they color the region red, black, and white. One of the largest volcanic depressions on Io is Loki Patera, with a diameter of 250 kilometers. It is partially filled with molten lava and covered with a hardened, thin crust. Similar lakes are directly connected with the magma reservoir located below them. And since the solidified lava is denser than the molten lava below, this crust can sink, increasing the thermal emissions of the volcano. During an eruption, the wave from the sinking crust spreads across the Patera at a rate of about one kilometer in 12 hours until the entire lake is again crusted over. On Mayo, massive cliffs have risen from the depths due to collisions of lithospheric layers and the pressure exerted by stone slabs. This process is similar to how mountains are formed on Earth. Apart from mountains and volcanoes, Io's surface is generally smooth with few meteorite impact craters. Another interesting feature of Io is the presence of ribbon-like dunes near the volcano Prometheus. These dunes are believed to be formed when hot lava comes into contact with frozen sulfur dioxide, causing it to release heat and gas, 
resulting in temporary winds that can carry grains of sand and create dunes. The Juno spacecraft has conducted the first of nine planned flights to Io. During two of these flybys, the spacecraft will approach Io at a distance of about 1,500 kilometers. The purpose of these close flybys is to study how volcanic eruptions interact with Jupiter's magnetic field and influence the occurrence of polar auroras. Io is considered one of the most captivating and extraordinary moons in the solar system. It is the fourth largest moon and the densest known. Its bright, multicolored surface is the most volcanically active in the solar system. Regarding exoplanets, astronomers have used the transit method to study their atmospheres and climate remotely. This method involves measuring the changes in starlight as the exoplanets pass in front of their host stars. This provides valuable information about the chemical composition of their atmospheres. The TRAPPIST-1 system, in particular, has been of interest as it offers opportunities to detect signs of biology beyond our solar system. The initial discovery of exoplanets in the TRAPPIST-1 system was made with a small telescope and later confirmed by the TRAPPIST, Spitzer, and Hubble telescopes. By measuring the orbital periods, sizes, and masses of these exoplanets, Astronomers have been able to determine their density and further composition. They have found that some exoplanets have a rocky composition, similar to Earth and Venus. Using data on the distance of exoplanets from their star and the temperature of the star, astronomers can further study the properties of these exoplanets. Researchers were able to conclude that some of them receive the same amount of light as many of the planets in the solar system, from Mercury to Mars. The James Webb Space Telescope has taken its first look at a long-awaited target, the atmospheres of seven Earth-sized planets orbiting the star TRAPPIST-1, just 39 light-years from Earth. All seven planets are in or near the habitable zone of their star and could have liquid water in one form or another. For astronomers, this is perhaps the best-known laboratory for studying planets outside the solar system for their suitability for life. Finally, the James Webb Telescope has set its sights on these distant worlds. It is worth noting that the telescope has confirmed that three of the seven known exoplanets in the TRAPPIST-1 system are in the habitable zone. Planets to E and F are the third, fourth, and fifth exoplanets, respectively, according to the measured density. TRAPPIST-1 bit, the first from the star, may either have a small nucleus or, more likely, contain a significant fraction of water or other volatiles in its composition. Due to the high surface temperatures of the first two exoplanets, the maintenance of water in liquid form there is highly unlikely. The fifth exoplanet, F, has a relatively low density and may be an ocean planet with a substantial amount of It is believed that the habitable zone may be wider if we consider volcanic hydrogen as a potential greenhouse gas contributing to the increase in climatic temperature. The telescope also observes some similarities with Proxima Centauri, namely that the X-ray emission of the TRAPPIST-1 system approximately corresponds to that of Proxima Centauri and the ultraviolet radiation produced by hydrogen atoms from the star's chromospheric layer is already six times less than that of Centauri. For this reason, the two closest exoplanets to the star, TRAPPIST-1-bit and TRAPPIST-1-c, could have lost their atmospheres and hydrospheric masses similar to Earth. However, replenishment of atmospheric hydrogen and oxygen may occur through a process that is yet to be determined. Researchers were able to conclude that some of them receive the same amount of light as many of the planets in the solar system, from Mercury to Mars. The James Webb Space Telescope has taken its first look at a long-awaited target, the atmospheres of seven Earth-sized planets orbiting the star TRAPPIST-1, just 39 light-years from Earth. All seven planets are in or near the habitable zone of their star and could have liquid water in one form or another. For astronomers, this is perhaps the best-known laboratory for studying planets outside the solar system for their suitability for life. Finally, the James Webb Telescope has set its sights on these distant worlds. It is worth noting that the telescope has confirmed that three of the seven known exoplanets in the TRAPPIST-1 system are in the habitable zone. Planets to E and F are the third, fourth, and fifth exoplanets, respectively, according to the measured density. TRAPPIST-1 bit, the first from the star, may either have a small nucleus or, more likely, contain a significant fraction of water or other volatiles in its composition. 
Due to the high surface temperatures of the first two exoplanets, the maintenance of water in liquid form there is highly unlikely. The fifth exoplanet, F, has a relatively low density and may be an ocean planet with a substantial amount of water in its interior. Interestingly, it is believed that the habitable zone may be wider if we consider volcanic hydrogen as a potential greenhouse gas contributing to the increase in climatic temperature. The telescope also observes some similarities with Proxima Centauri, namely that the X-ray emission of the TRAPPIST-1 system approximately corresponds to that of Proxima Centauri, and the ultraviolet radiation produced by hydrogen atoms from the star's chromospheric layer is already six times less than that of Centauri. For this reason, the two closest exoplanets to the star, TRAPPIST-1-bit and TRAPPIST-1-c, could have lost their atmospheres and hydrospheric masses similar to Earth. However, replenishment of atmospheric hydrogen and oxygen may occur through a process that is yet to be determined. The Earth-like planet, the gravitational force, also slightly deforms both the planet itself and its inhabitants, because of which high volcanic activity is observed. Similar processes occur on one of the moons of Jupiter. Researchers have already received approval to study the atmosphere of LP 791-18 with the James Webb Telescope thanks to which it will be possible to learn more about the planet. The James Webb Space Telescope is now practically the world's premier space observatory, allowing us to peer into distant worlds around other stars, explore mysterious structures, and learn more about the origins of the universe and our place in it. So far, nearly 6,000 exoplanets and 4,000 star systems have already been confirmed, with several thousand more candidates awaiting verification. Of course, the public's attention is focused on planets that are as Earth-like as possible. We have not given up hope of finding intelligent life in space. However, the bulk of distant worlds look very strange to us. There are often conditions there that we can't even imagine. After all, science fiction writers have long advised people not to fixate on our carbon-based form of life. There may be much in the universe beyond our understanding, but science exists to push those boundaries. The properties of light and its impact on our lives never cease to amaze us. Light, or electromagnetic waves, plays a central role in many aspects of our lives and is a key concept in physics. Fundamental questions, such as the interaction of light with matter, the propagation of light waves, and the transfer of energy, have been the basis for many important discoveries and theories in physics. But if light is a type of electromagnetic radiation spectrum, that is usually can associated be said about a concept like particle. darkness, more precisely, the concept is there, but is the phenomenon itself there? Even if you turn off the sun, the Earth will not plunge into total darkness. Light from stars, nebulae, and even the Big Bang itself will illuminate your sky. In this case, the planet itself and everything on it, including our bodies, also emit light, and it will be visible in the infrared. Even if you somehow found a way to turn off the sun, it will still emit a certain level of light almost forever. There's enough for our age and for many centuries to come. But of course, it will be eerie to realize the eternal cold. So as long as we can see, we'll see. No optical sensor can detect total darkness or take black holes, the darkest of supposed objects. Even they are capable of emitting some percentage of light. According to some theories in physics, unlike in the realm of interpersonal relationships, light always defeats darkness. Electromagnetic waves are a collection of alternating electric and magnetic fields that propagate through space at a specific frequency and wavelength. The spectrum of electromagnetic radiation includes, in addition to visible light, radio waves, microwaves, infrared, ultraviolet, X-rays, and gamma rays. Yes, light plays an important role in physics because of its ability to interact with matter and change its properties. When light particles, photons, are absorbed, atoms and molecules move to higher energy levels, which can cause chemical reactions, thermal radiation, changes in the state of matter, and even nuclear reactions. Where does light itself come from? Let's take the example of the emission of light by the sun. In our star, numerous chemical and thermonuclear reactions take place, which are accompanied by the emission of photons. When two hydrogen atoms collide, they combine to form one atom called deuterium, which is lighter than the atoms from which it was formed, and the extra energy is released as a photon. Deuterium, in turn, 
joins one more hydrogen atom and helium-3 is formed and one more photon is released. When two helium-3 atoms collide, helium-4, two hydrogen atoms, and one more photon are formed. So the sun from four hydrogen atoms produces one helium atom and three photons, and that's just from one chain of reactions. Each of these photons carries a large amount of energy and for tens of thousands and millions of years, wanders inside the sun, colliding with atoms, heating up the sun and turning into dozens of photons with less energy and frequency visible to the eye. Sooner or later, these photons fly out of the sun and go on a long and journey through space, and some of them come to Earth, giving us light and warmth. Now, what are the physical characteristics of light? First, it is speed. One of the most important fundamental constants in physics is the speed of light, which in a vacuum is equal to almost 300,000 kilometers slash what about the speed of darkness? How fast will the eerie darkness descend upon us? The simplest answer is that the speed of darkness is the same as the speed of light. If we turn off the sun, our sky will be dark eight minutes from now. What we used to call the speed of light is the speed of propagation, and it is not always the deciding factor. The shadow that falls across the landscape is cast by objects, and the feature of those objects and the distance from them will determine how fast it falls. For example, a rotating lighthouse searchlight illuminates the surroundings at regular intervals. However, the relative rate of dimming of the surroundings increases with increasing distance from the lighthouse itself. If you move far enough away from the lighthouse, the shadow will catch up with you faster than the speed of light propagation. In other words, the same thing happens the speed of light can be understood as a delay in perception. Even if a beacon is pointed directly at you, you will see the light with some delay. However, this delay has no effect on the actual events that you will observe from your position. Regardless, you have been detected and have nowhere to escape. Light has an inherent wavelength, and the visible light spectrum is just a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that our eyes can perceive. The cone-shaped cells in our eyes are tuned to wavelengths within this narrow band, while other parts of the spectrum have wavelengths that are either too large or too small and energetic for us to see. When objects become hotter, they emit energy with shorter wavelengths, leading to a change in color. For example, the flame of a blowtorch changes from reddish to bluish as it burns hotter. Similarly, the color of stars can indicate their temperature. Our sun emits more yellow light because its surface temperature is around 5,500 degrees. If the sun's surface were colder, around 3,000 degrees, it would appear reddish like the star Betelgeuse. Conversely, if the sun were hotter, around 12,000 degrees, it would look blue like the star Rigel. Reflection, refraction, and absorption are the basic processes that occur when light interacts with matter. Reflection happens when light reflects off objects and bounces back, giving us an image through a mirror. Refraction occurs when light changes direction as it passes from one medium to another with different densities, which can lead to displaced or distorted images in water compared to air. Lastly, absorption happens when light is converted into another form of energy, such as heat, upon hitting an object's surface. This occurs due to the interaction between light waves and material particles. For example, when an object is illuminated with blue light, it may absorb the blue waves and reflect red and green waves, resulting in a greenish appearance. Red, this explains why objects have certain colors. They absorb some light waves and reflect others, and it is not the work of sorcerers. So the interaction of these three processes determines how we perceive light and see objects in the world around us. Reflection and refraction form the images of the objects we see, while absorption determines their color and brightness. Unlike light, darkness is not a physical category, but rather a relative state. It is the subjective perception of the absence of photons. However, our experience of darkness itself does not have a speed. It is a subjective experience that can change over time, but the individual components of that experience exist outside of time. In the world of quantum physics, space itself may be a derivative concept, and the traditional notions of position, distance, and speed may become irrelevant. In conclusion, the properties of light are inseparable and of great importance. Light is a form of electromagnetic radiation consisting of photons, which propagate at a constant speed in a vacuum. It exhibits both wave and particle characteristics. 
This duality is a key aspect of understanding quantum mechanics and phenomena like interference, diffraction, and polarization. Light is vital on Earth and in the universe as it delivers information, creates conditions for life, and serves as a tool for studying our surroundings. It is a magical phenomenon that allows us to perceive and interact with the world, appreciate nature's beauty, and communicate with others. The origin of light, however, remains an open question.